right, so let's throw log 3 into your calculator. This is your um, common log button over here. It just says log on it. So we can do the log of 3 and we round our answer to maybe three decimal places. So point, um, 0.477. All right, the next one that they gave us was 2 times the log base 10 of 2.5. All right, so 2 log 2.5. If you're using a scientific calculator, which sometimes we have to do for tests and quizzes, you need to check the um, keystroke sequence that you would need to use for that because you might have to do the log of 2.5 first and get that answer and then multiply it by 2, but just play around with that and see what you need to do. All right, so we did log of 3 and got 0.477, and we did 2 times the log of 2.5 and got 0.796. All right, so now that we have a pretty good feel for um, the algebraic side of the logarithmic functions, then let's look at the graphs of logarithms. All right, if I have um, g of x is equal to the log base 2 of x, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch that to its exponential form. So if that's y equals the log base 2 of x, I could say 2 to the y equals x. So 2 to the y is equal to x. And it makes it very easy for us to see how that's the inverse of an exponential because typically when I'm working with an exponential, it's something like y equals 2 to the x, and this is x equals 2 to the y, right? Remember in inverses that x and y just switch places. So that's another way that we can see it there. So if I'm going to graph this, I'm just going to make an xy chart, but if you'll notice, when you're graphing a logarithm, even when you write it in its exponential form, it's a whole lot easier to put in values for y and solve for x than it would be to put in values for x and solve for y. So I'm going to make the xy chart like we normally do, you know, throw in 0, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, but I'm throwing them in for y and finding the x values. All right, so if we put 0 in for y, 2 to the 0 is... 1. If we put 1 in for y, 2. If we put negative 1 in for y, if we put 2 in for y, and if we put negative 2 in for y. Good. All right, so let's plot those points. We got 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1 half negative 1, and 1 fourth negative 2. Now, I have a pretty good feel with these three points up here. Uh, you know, it's pretty crystal clear what that part of the graph is doing. I may be a little unclear of what's going on down here because I connect these three points, but I'm not sure. Is it going to come down here and cross over that y-axis and come over here, or is it going to run along that axis? I'm not really sure. And so I could throw in a few more values, like... Um, I need some more. I was putting in negative 1 and negative 2. I could come down here and put in like negative 10 or negative 100. That discussion sounds familiar, right? We did that exact same thing when we were exploring with the exponential. So I could do that, and I would find out that I keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller positive numbers. I'm getting closer and closer to that y-axis without touching it. The other thing I can do is I can utilize that fact that I know the exponential and the logarithmic are inverses of each other, all right? If we were graphing x equals 2 to the y, and I know that its inverse is y equals 2 to the x, I can graph y equals 2 to the x really fast and easy, right? Let's use our two landmarks. We have a landmark of a y-intercept of 1 and a horizontal asymptote at 0, so that gives me this piece of the graph. And then all I would need to do is maybe just come over here and plot one more point. So we typically plug in 1, so 2 to the 1 would be 2. That would give me the point 1, 2, and now I know what that piece of the graph looks like. So we've said that with those two landmarks, we can literally just plot one point and have a nearly perfect graph, right? We know several things about the graphs of inverses that will help us here. First off, we know that they reflect in the line y is equal to x. So that would be one way of me seeing what this piece of the graph is doing and utilizing that to help me see what this piece of the graph would do. The other thing is, with inverses, x and y switch places. So if you'll notice, the two landmarks that we used for our exponential, we had the point 0, 1. If x and y switch places, 
that would give me a landmark on the logarithmic of one zero, right? Our other landmark was we had a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. If x and y switch places, that should give me a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. So if I had, for my logarithmic function, if I had a vertical asymptote and I had that x-intercept, I would know exactly what that piece of the graph looked like. And then all I would need to do is just come over here and plot maybe one point, and then I would have a flawless graph. All right? So for an exponential function, we have an intercept of 0, 1. For a logarithmic, that's an intercept of 1, 0. For an exponential, we have the asymptote at y equals 0. For a logarithmic, x and y switch places, it's x equals 0. And because we typically associate x with domain and y with range, if x and y switch places, domain and range switch places, right? The domain of the exponential is the range of the logarithmic. And the range of the exponential is the domain of the logarithmic. So all that stuff that we already learned about exponentials can really help us here with nailing down our logarithmics as well. Okay. So example number six, they say, now that you know how to graph a logarithmic, let's graph it and let's do some shifting and reflecting and those other things that we already know how to do. So let's start with the original function, f of x is equal to the log base 10 of x. That's my common log, right? So I could go through and let's use our two landmarks. I could um, go through and say, I'm going to switch it to its exponential form so it's a little easier to work with. But I know that I have two landmarks for the logarithmic. I have a vertical asymptote at 0, and I have an x-intercept at 1. So I already know what this piece of the graph is doing. I can go ahead and fill it in. And now all I really need to know is how steep to make this other piece. Like, is it going to come up like this, or is it going to come more like this, or is it going to be flat like this? I just don't know what to do with that. So I need one point. And we had said it's easier to plug in values for y and find x. So I obviously need to plug in a positive y value. I'm just going to pick positive 1. So if I plug in a positive 1 for y, I get 10 to the 1 or 10 for x. So I would have the point 10, 1. So I'm going to come all the way down here to 10 and come up to 1. That's going to make that graph really flat. So there's the graph of my common log. All right, so now I want to do some shifting. If I compare my original f of x function with the g of x function that they gave me here, the only difference is that minus 1. Can that 1 be moved to the other side and grouped to with the y? No. So that means it's stuck to the x, so it's going to cause a what? Horizontal shift, yes. If any value subtracted from y is a vertical shift, any value subtracted from x is a horizontal shift. So what is my horizontal shift? Positive 1, right. So let's take that original f of x graph that we drew and let's horizontally shift it a positive 1. Is your asymptote going to move? Yes. My asymptote was here at 0. If my graph shifts over 1, my asymptote is now going to be over here at x is equal to 1. My intercept was at 1. Where is it going to be? at 2. Uh -huh. So now I have that point and I have my asymptote. I also could take this point and bump it over 1 if I want to. And then I would have all the guides that I need to sketch that graph. Alright, look at h of x. For h of x, if I go back and I compare it to the original function, the difference is this 2 right here. What's that 2 going to cause? Vertical shift, right. Vertical shift of what? Positive 2, right. So I'm going to go back to the original green graph. I'm going to ignore the blue one right now. Go back to the original green graph. If I vertically shift up 2, is my asymptote going to change? No. Is my intercept going to change? Yes. It was right here. It's going to come up 2. So I could give myself that new intercept. I could come over here and take this point and bump it up 2 if I needed a guide. And then with the asymptote and the intercept and the point, I could draw my graph. Alright, so here is our homework for tonight on pages 236 to 237.